Yeah, look, I, I think there's, you know, it's, it's um, we need to, we need to be uh, careful and we need to be skeptical, perhaps, you know, have a healthy level of, of skepticism to what we, uh, what we see and, and read online. Uh, and, uh, and if, you know, when you're in conversations with people and they uh, tell you about things that, you know, doesn't sound, sound to be completely you know, factual, we need to ask people and ask ourselves as well, where did, where did you get this information from? Where did you hear that? And, and because we, we are so bombarded with information all the time and we hear so many things, we see so many things, and then sometimes it's hard to just sort of, yeah, where did I get that from? Because we've heard it so many times, and we, you know, things we've heard so many times, so that we just internalize it and think that oh, this, this, this must be true. But you know, we, we need to start thinking about it, question our assumptions about uh, important topics. And then if you can't answer that question yourself, like I, 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 I can't remember, I don't recall where I found this information, or where I got this from, then you know, do a bit of digging and, and see where, where it leads you. And if those sources are credible or reliable or not. So good morning, everyone. Another episode of Explain Why. This is uh, Miko Santos and welcome to the show. So we're going to be discussing about increasingly why we're increasingly turning to influencer for information. It is, is this a big problem? So the internet has uh, made the idea of truth more complicated than it used to be. This is because of how easy to get information from these days. So a quick and even a bite-sized uh, cognitive online learning experience has taken place of the old structure and methodical ways of learning. And everyone with access to the internet can now get information so knowledge is no longer something that only a few people have. But now it's also for anyone to share information. This is where the difficulty of finding the truth comes in. And one of the many bad unintended effects of digitization uh, is disseminization. Uh, that is disinformation. Sorry about that. So for today's episode, we're talking to Dr. Torgier Alete. He's a senior lecturer in marketing at RMIT University in Melbourne, Australia. He is known for his contribution to the field of marketing with a focus on consumer-related topics. He has published several books and articles mainly related to consumer socialization and social learning process. Please welcome to the show, Dr. Toriel Alete. Hello, good morning, uh, doctor. Good morning to you. Thanks so, for having me. Thank you so much for for your time. So there's a lot of happening right now about it. Stay on the latest um, latest information that, according to the recent study, nearly half or 44 percent of Gen Z consumer reporting making a purchase based on an influencer recommendation compared to 26 of the broader population. Can you let's start with uh, what are some of the risks on an ethical concern associated with influencers on social media platform and how do this issue impact the society and, the, and their followers? Okay, I uh, just wanted to start uh, from the beginning and, and sort of like some of the reasons why influencers are so popular. Uh, inf an influencer on social media can, can quite often feel uh, more relatable to people than uh, than you know a more sort of boring perhaps expert. Uh, so influencers often present as just being a, a regular person. I'm just like you know I'm just like you. I'm just like everyone else, uh, and therefore they they present it as being someone that that is easier to uh, to relate to, uh, and and that makes them. Uh, be perceived as more authentic, uh, and therefore we have an, uh, a greater tendency to to trust in uh, in what they what they say and the information they deliver. Uh, however, 
many influencers may not be particularly uh, skilled or trained or have any appropriate expertise to talk about the topic uh, that they present on uh, and that uh, can be problematic because because the the uh, delivery may be uh, appealing it may be charismatic uh, but the content is not actually based on uh, insight and expertise in the field that the influencer uh, supposedly present on uh, so that's one side of it. Uh, the other side of it is, uh, especially when we're talking about short video format, which is uh, typically TikTok or now also YouTube sh uh, shorts, uh, is that you, you can only cover so many details in a short video clip. Uh, so you need to, uh, if, if you're talking about something you know, very complex, like you know, conflict in, uh, in the Middle East, then you, you can't cover that. You can't, you can't tell people what that conflict is all about within a couple of minutes in a TikTok video. So you need to take enormous shortcuts to get to perhaps a very cheap point on, uh, on something that, that deserves more depth uh, in order for people to, to understand. So those are our two critical uh, problems with uh, uh, one with influencers in general and uh, the other in particular with, uh, with the, the channel. So, yeah, thank you for that. So are you saying, uh, Dr. Aletta, because on a short size bit uh, platform, you cannot explain the total the totality of this information and misinformation? Uh, that's a little bit outside of my area as, uh, as a marketing academic. Uh, but uh, you know, important distinctions could be made between, between looking at the intent of the person uh, of, of the content that's being delivered. If it is, uh, uh, if the person presenting know that they're presenting false information and does so uh, purposely in order to make a point, as opposed to being ill-informed and just uh, spreading spreading things that are unintentionally. Uh, inaccurate, which you know can happen in uh, in any level of journalism as well, for that matter. Thank you for that. So this is uh, I have another question. This is a little bit, um, maybe some people will think it's a little bit controversial, but uh, we're we're talking about this in in the sense of on academic sides and based on the research yep. and learning that we have. What are what are the potential consequence of influencer promoting conspiracy theories and extremist ideologies to their followers? Well, I, I guess, as, as I said initially as well, that uh, influencers quite often present as, as charismatic. They uh, present as, uh, as relatable because they are not uh, part of the you know, cultural elite or whatnot, which uh, for some reason, people at universities tends to be uh, boxed into, uh, uh, and and therefore they can continue to undercut uh, knowledge and undercut uh, uh, advances in, in research in any, in any field, uh, and and that yeah so so it 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 can lead to you know, further erosion of trust in uh, in society's institutions such as. A uh, university, uh, in exchange for you know, more uh, media persona or, or influences found on uh, on social media channels, uh, and and if those uh, influences are not informed on the topics they present about, then that uh, can be quite problematic. Thank you for that. So uh, the next question: Have influencer action? Because sometimes they post about anything, they do opinion on on anything. What what is you said? What is the ethic, ethical concern does this raise? Well, I, I guess that part of the problem is that you, especially if you're if you're a professional influencer, then then you're operating within a very very different uh, economic framework and with a very different business logic than. You know, what, what I would operate under as, as an academic. Uh, 
Uh, so what, what what makes your bread and butter in that space is the number of likes and views that you get. So so you need to say things and do things that you know put food on the table, and that is to uh, to, to get people to to view your content. That is your currency uh, because that's that's how the platforms are incentivized. It's the size of the audience and the likes that you get. Uh, and so we, we know what, what works and what, what people will click on. You know, the term clickbait is very well known. Uh, and therefore, you know, it's, it's, uh, it is in the influencer's interest, uh, best interest quite often to be edgy and go a little bit further with, with what you say and, and, and push points. Uh, if they are not entirely true or sometimes completely false, then you know, as long as people view it, that puts the food on the table for that influencer, and so they, they there's a there's an inbuilt incentive for that to uh, to. Thank you very much. In connection with that, uh, Dr. Alete, is that um, in what way can influencer influence their audience purchase, purchasing decision, like and consumption habit? Yeah, yeah, those are the. Those are very common ways that influencers work. And so in, in my area of marketing, uh, working with influencers is increasing uh, a lot in, in, uh, in, in popularity uh, because it's, uh, it, it's much easier for, for consumers to, to sort of get to that level of, of, of trust and understanding in, uh, in a product that they consider buying when it's presented by someone that uh, appears to be authentic and that appears to be, you know, just a regular consumer, just just like, uh, just like them, uh, and, uh, and, and and so that's it, you know, it's it's a very powerful uh, marketing tool that's uh, that's been growing uh, a lot in uh, in popularity. But uh, yeah, we, we we also see a uh, uh, like the whole influencer space in in marketing is is growing and it's splitting up into different sort of categories of influencers you have your you know big celebrities that's got a high like a big audience loads of followers uh, but their perception of insights and knowledge may be more sort of general uh, they can reach a lot of people but they have less sort of direct connections with them and then you have you know micro influencers that are more niche that perhaps operate within a a certain geographic region or that have uh, a certain level of, of interest and expertise in a more sort of uh, narrow field and then talks about talks about that uh, more directly and then therefore have a more stronger connection with their, their audience. Is there any danger of that? Because as you said, influencer can influence audience, but if they are providing, say, purchasing uh, like a product, and they say it's okay, but how do we make sure that they provide accurate and responsible information to their followers? Yes, no, there's, um, <clears throat> that's that's a good question. It's, uh, it's, it's a very complex question as well, because because we I think we, we need to remember that this is you know a relatively new media, and this whole space uh, is or at least has been. Un, completely unregulated, and regulation is now coming in. Uh, if you if you sort of think about it in uh, in contrast to more you know, established media forms like television, you, we we know and we accept that you know you, it needs to be you know a, a, a vignette that says now this is an ad break, and you need to signpost for consumers of the TV show that now you're watching uh, advertisements, now you're watching the program. And, and you can't just sort of, there's rules and regulations for product placement on television and what you can and cannot do. Uh, in a social media space, that has been in a complete wild west. You can do whatever you want. Uh, but regulation is now sort of coming in there and perhaps catching up a little bit. Uh, so. If, if consumers don't know, you know, to what extent they're being sold a product, or, or you know, if, if, is this influencer just uh, reviewing this product because they love that product category and they just want to tell, they just want to inform, they just want to help, 
uh, or are they actually being paid and sponsored for by the by the company to say those things? And our consumers uh, have a right to know those things. And and in the past, <laughs> we we were protected by, by codes on television, at least to 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 know the difference there. Uh, so that that needs to to catch up and it is catching up uh, as well. So laws and regulations are coming in uh, in this space uh, from uh, from many countries around, uh, around the world, including Australia. So so that's just from the very basis that, and, and research in this area all have also long before regulations came in has already confirmed that uh, it has always been in the influencer's best interest to disclose whether content is sponsored. Uh, so it's it's better the influencers increase their trust if they upfront say uh, whether or not they received products for free or whether or not they were paid for a by a business to to make certain uh, certain claims about about products. So so any sort of dishonesty from a or, or a purpose hiding of uh, information by from an influencer is not. Uh, it's not good for the influencer. People, the audiences will trust them less, and that's sort of been uh, research has shown that before regulations sort of starting to catch up. So that's been, been quite obvious. Do you reckon that this social media platform um, owners do some regulation on by their uh, on their end about this information, this information, or different fake news or is that do you think yeah they... i i think uh you know, like what what seems to have been been happening in this space is that the social media platforms won't necessarily do that regulation unless uh unless they are compelled to do so either by threat of, of legal actions uh or uh, because their rapid decline in, in popularity as, as a result. But it, I, I have not seen them uh, being proactive. Uh, rather, it, the process has been, because, uh, I mean, TikTok is you know, the new kid on the block, but YouTube's been around for a very long time. And, and uh, if we're going to focus on on video, uh, video uh, content, uh, and... Uh, the approach was you know, let the algorithms run amok first uh, and let the algorithms decide what content's going to be go up and down and then and then yeah so it was basically we, we were all part of a massive social experiment and and then later when you know there's uh, stories come out of, of particularly unsavory content being pushed to the top and and being you know promoted on the platform and then uh, that creates you know, negative publicity, and then the uh, company goes in and is so like, "Oh yeah, we can remove this content," and uh, or or they try to tweak their algorithms to not promote certain types of content. But uh, you know, those things, uh, yeah, those things obviously is is expensive. It costs. You, you need you know, human moderators, and uh, and you need uh, more sophisticated computer models to to improve those those algorithms. The, uh, the cheap and, and basic recommendation uh, 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 approach uh, with, with the algorithms is sort of how how it started. So you're saying about the algorithm. Have you what is your thought about uh, artificial intelligence is using this to spread this information? Have you heard about that? Yeah. Look, it's it's uh, just sort of very basic how this these platforms work is that you know they the purpose of the platform is to maximize the time that users spend on the platform uh, and uh, i mean quite often we, we we sort of conflate things and assume that there is some conspiracy behind it or that there's some nefarious you know uh, agenda that wants us to to do certain things but it like most of the time, these algorithms are just blind to all of that. It's just, uh, it's just a matter of you know how can we maximize people to you know, the amount of time that they spend on the platform. Uh, so every time you click on a video, uh, the algorithm learns a little bit more about you. Uh, 
So it's a matter of getting as much information about you as a user as possible uh, to know a lot about you and know what you like, know what you click on, know how long you would watch that particular content. Uh, and you know, if you didn't take the bite there, you do only watch a little bit and you know, try to give you something else. And then the more you use the platform, the more it knows about you uh, and the harder it then becomes for you to resist that continuation of, of staying, uh, staying engaged uh, with the platform. And that's, but that's what sort of makes it dangerous in a sense, because you lose that control. You, you, but but you, you get the illusion of being in control because you, I, I clicked on that, I like that content, you know, I wanted to see that. Uh, but it's uh, it, the way that it works is actually the other way around. You're not in control. The algorithm knows what you want to see before you, before it's recommended to you. Thank you so much for that, uh, Dr. Aliti. So. <laughs> We're talking about uh, TikTok, old video based TikTok, YouTube. How about, do you have experience on, how about the audio side of things like podcasting? Is this similar on doing this sort of thing? Because recent uh, yeah, studies it, said it, it, that, so, sorry, so recent studies said that podcasting is, is one of the trusted media form as well. Yes, uh, it is, and you're right. And it, it does work in a uh, in a sort of similar way in terms of being recommended other uh, podcasts based on the on the podcast that you're watching. Uh, and and the thing with with podcasts is that you know, we we are, we are so busy these days with uh, with our devices most of the time, and uh, and that mobile phone is with us constantly and we constantly stare at that tiny screen. Uh, the the only times we don't, when we put our phone down is when we are engaged in some sort of activity where we cannot look at our mobile screen, like sleeping, but or, or other things like, you know, when you're driving, you can't stare at your mobile screen, although some people you know, still do, but you, you have to put that phone a little bit aside or if you're out exercising or, or stuff like that and that's where podcast really comes in it's when you your hands are you know occupied so you can't hold the phone so you, then, and then you can listen uh, and that is becoming now a very um, uh, very important uh, media because we, we, we are so distracted on the phone because everything is on there. We have you know, so many different apps and every every of those apps and including what we're looking at within the platform we are, but also any other app that's on your phone is in a constant competition for your attention. Uh, when you're exercising, driving, washing the dishes and you, you can't, like then all of that competition is gone. And so you can listen to a podcast and the audience is then more captive. So you, it's it's easier than to, uh, to to influence people because you have more of their attention than what you would otherwise have. Uh, so that's sort of part of the reason why um, uh, why podcasts uh, are then becoming more popular. But I mean, you, on those platforms, you have the exact same problems with influences that you have on. Uh, on, on other media, and that is, you know, do, do they actually know what they're talking about? What, what is their qualifications uh, to discuss these topics? Uh, and quite often they don't have proper qualifications and accreditations to talk, talk about them, to discuss in detail the topics they talk about. Uh, and that becomes a problem, and then, uh, uh, then we get further spread of uh, uh, of misinformation thank you for that so it's so youtube tiktok podcasting it's also things online on this um danger if you don't know what what are you talking about um dr Oleta, it's what ethical guidelines and regulation if we have are in place to to address the danger associated with influencers 
and how effective are they in ensuring responsible influencer behavior? Yeah, I, uh, I'm, I'm not a, a legal scholar, so I got to be careful what I say about that. But uh, I think the um, there's a lot of catching up to do uh, in order to to be uh, effective in this uh, in this space uh, because it's you know anyone can start a podcast and and to and these these platforms are made you know, accessible for a reason so that anyone can create content uh, and it's hard to you know you can't regulate and stop people creating content uh, and uh, as, as we often hear from, from anyone that's you know, spreading particularly unsavory false narratives, uh, if they get silenced, then the outcries about cancel culture and, uh, and, and you know, oversight, freedom of speech comes immediately in the aftermath of that. Uh, so so it's, it seems that we're a little bit stuck there at the moment uh, in terms of, in terms of proper control and, and regulation because these platforms uh, and the way this works is uh, is unprecedented it is it is nothing like what we've seen before uh, and therefore we we still haven't quite figured out how to grapple with it and how to you know use this to create a better society thank you for that before we wrap wrap, we wrap the the episode for for today uh, dr alite and you are also co-founder of Shaping Connection. Can you tell us about this? Yeah, so when I don't teach undergraduate students digital marketing, I work on the sort of other side of things. Uh, Shaping Connections is a research program that looks at uh, uh, digital and social inclusions and, uh, and uh, older, uh, older Australians. So it's about, uh, there's a lot of, I suppose it's very much related to what we talk about here and, and people are you know afraid they're concerned and they have fears of, uh, of, of using technology these platforms and that fear is particularly strong in uh, in many of our uh, older Australians uh, and so we're working on on ways of uh, uh, of, of making older people uh, connect meaningfully on their own terms and uh, and engage with uh, with the digital economy and, uh, and you know, doing the things that they uh, that they want to do uh, and and not having you know, skills and knowledge being a barrier for for them to to meaningfully engage and interact with uh, with friends and family through uh, through digital means. Thank you for that. Any any parting word, uh, Dr. Aleta? or to our audience who listen this and also watching right now as yeah look i i think there's you know it's it's um we need to we need to be uh careful and we need to be skeptical perhaps you know have a healthy level of, of skepticism to what we uh what we see and and read online uh and um uh, and if you know when you're in conversations with people and they uh, tell you about things that you know doesn't sound sound to be completely you know, factual. We need to ask people and ask ourselves as well. Where did, where did you get this information from? Where did you hear that? And and because we we are so bombarded with information all the time, and we hear so many things, read, see so many things, and then sometimes it's hard to just sort of yeah, where did I get that from? Because we've heard it so many times, and we, we, it's things we've heard so many times, so that we just internalize it and think that oh, this, this this must be true. But you know, we, we need to start think about and question our assumptions about uh, important topics. And then, if you can't answer that question yourself, like I, 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 I can't remember, I don't recall where I found this information, where I got this from. Then, you know, to do a bit of digging and and see where where it leads you. And if those sources are credible or reliable or not. Thank you so much for that. Uh, thank you, Dr. Tagir Alete. He's a senior lecturer in marketing in RMIT University in Melbourne. Thank you so much. Thank you. 
Okay, thank you so much to to our guests for today. So it's it's about the information that influencers are feeding to us. So even thought, you know, as a as a journalist, we work hard to make objectivity and credibility the most important part of their of our job over time. Through journalism code of ethics, a lot of things must be in true in order to become a journalist. So not everyone can write content. They used to say that content creation, which is what they do now, had to not only produce good work, but also meet a certain level of most moral standard before it could be made a public. So we have a code of ethics for that. To keep lies from spreading, there needs to be a clear separation between facts and opinion. Reporter and some professional content creators are the only one who follow the code of ethics these days. The vast majority of people on the internet who are now also thought as a content creators don't even know the code of ethics which makes it impossible for fake news which makes it possible for the fake news to spread. So as as, as our least as our uh, expert said you need to fact check everything that you listen that you watch through internet thank you so much for watching and listening for our podcast explain why and see you again for another exciting episode thank you so much and always keep safe see ya